What's going on, guys? My name's Corey Komori, and welcome to Lyric Breakdowns here on the Breakdown Channel. And in today's episode, I have a special guest with me, Mr. Cole Millward. Cole, hi there. Thank you for having uh, the t- take. Thank you for taking the time uh, to come in on this episode. And uh, it's an honor. Thank you for. Uh, your, I, I assume that you're going to bring in all your insights because you are the resident expert, at least that I know of, <laughs> of Haken. Because I'm a relative newcomer to Haken, but it's a band that I've. I mean, I've jumped headfirst into almost all of their material, and I'm just like, oh, my God, this band is awesome. But I'm still a bit of a newbie, so that's why I'm bringing the expert in. <laughs> um, so uh, so real quick, Cole, uh, so let folks know what it is that you do uh, for a living. Let, let people know what it is that uh, – just what you do, like, I- involved with music, because our interactions have really uh, been centered around music, and yeah. we've played music together. We've just been in bands that have played shows together. So real quick uh, – Go ahead and talk about some of the stuff that you're involved in currently. Okay, um, so I, I'd like to say first and foremost that I'm um, I'm a, a bassist um, and I play. I, I have been for uh, let's see, I want to say ten years since this uh, this past November, um, and throughout most of my career as a bassist, that's manifested in playing in local original bands, um, metal and progressive music, just because that's like my my whole shtick. Um, but lately I've kind of expanded that out to incorporate cover bands as well. Cause especially, uh, once I, once I graduated and everything, um, there was kind of this looking for, for ways to, to, you know, use that experience of course. And I, I discovered that, um, the playing weddings is a pretty good way to, to make money as a musician. You went the Adam Sandler basis. route, except the bass version. If right, yeah, <laughs> the wedding, exactly. The wedding basis. So, um, <laughs> well, wedding singer as well, because you do sing in, in a lot of those bands, too. Yes, uh, that's something that I picked up a few years back, just discovered that uh, that was something that made me a bit more valuable as a, uh, um, as a band member in some of those cover bands was to be able to sing lead on some stuff, so I picked that up as well. Um, and if it, I'm definitely going to include some clips and, and some like uh, video and some uh, photos <laughs> sure. of his. If you see his bass, the, the bass that he plays, <laughs> it's ridiculous. And you just go, really? It wasn't enough for you to just be able to play that. You got to sing, too. <laughs> yeah, well, but, that actually I mean, that also like we talk about things that I'm doing lately. Uh, I think most of my uh, my students, because because I also teach music, uh, guitar and bass at um, Ballantine School of Music, as well as um, some private students as well. Um, all of them could basically tell you that over the past couple of months, they've seen so many basses come through our lessons because I've just been trying different, different stuff, different feels of different instruments and everything, and um, and it's it's become quite a, a funny little um, thing that like every time I walk into a lesson, they're like, "What you got for us this time?" Um, so, but yes, the the latest ones that I've settled on are these uh, these really cool um, Ormsby six string fan fret models. Um, made in australia they're really super cool um but yeah aside from playing the cover stuff the the stuff that i um that i really enjoy and get into is on the basis for a band called ozai progressive band we've been around since um i think 2009 and so i want to say like probably this month makes 10 years that that band has been a thing wow really yeah which is which is really crazy to think back on because i i still remember with decent clarity those those earliest days of um um being under a different name of course but mm-hmm. it's, it's been essentially the same group of people i remember those days of the different name yeah <laughs> the, the scene was was different back then but um, a lot more venues around here in charlotte yeah exactly so um that band we're in the process of um working on our our latest record the, our first full-length record under the name ozai um, and we've been working on this record for like probably three or four years at this point, just because um, we've been really taking our time and we've had some lineup changes in the process. Um, it's only Kamori at this point because it's been three <laughs> years for us, three, almost three and a half, I believe. Ugh, yeah, I think about it. I just, it's I just, um, but I mean, our, our whole mentality is we under under our previous band name, we, we put out material before it was really ready. Um, and then with our first thing as Ozai, we put out an EP that had like four songs that I think we did pretty well with, but this time it's like, we want to do the full package and, right. and get that, get that out there. That's also a progressive metal group. Um, just focusing a lot on, um, actually pretty similar styles to the kind of stuff that we're going to be talking about today. Yeah. Um, very, uh, uh, 
conceptually based at times. I, I, yeah. I know that uh, your lead singer Phil, mm-hmm. uh, he he tends to he throws a lot of uh, lo- lots of awesome nerdy uh, sci-fi type of uh, vibes into everything that, that both of us do. Uh, Phil and I are are kind of the main lyricists of okay. the band, and um, that. You know the the two different styles kind of play off of each other in in really nice ways. Um, I know you're you're probably uh, with the sci-fi reference. You're probably kind of referring to um, our song "Life, the Universe, and Everything." Yes, <laughs> that, that makes <laughs> like it it it's a quote from um, from Hitchhiker's Guide, and it is all about Hitchhiker's well, Guide. Well, but even so. your name, the band's name, you know, Avatar: The Last Airbender. You yes. know, so it's just like okay, these guys. I remember the first yeah. time I saw you guys play. I was like, <laughs> I can get down with this shit right here. This yeah. is, this is my shit right here. It's, <laughs> it's all just a bunch of nerd references and like what what kind of media we consume, what do we like, and and Absolutely. we just make references to all of that. So um, we do that. I'm also um, you do solo work as well because you did release a solo. Was it yeah. an EP or was it an album? Um, it was an EP. Um, that was under the Harry Parrot moniker. Yes, that was that's my my solo project, uh, Harry Parrot, which. I haven't done much with since I released that EP because that was mostly like um, I was I was still very much in the process of of pushing my um, my audio engineering mm-hmm. expertise, uh, which is another thing that I do. Um, and so that was kind of uh, I wanted to see if I could write a song like every part of it and record it myself and mix it and master it and all of that stuff myself and release it start to finish all myself. I just wanted to see if that was possible, something that I had it within myself to do. Cause I hear all the time with, uh, with a lot of artists who get started on a project and can never finish it. I wanted to prove to myself that I could finish that. Right. Um, without the, um, I guess the, the, the help of other people kind of pushing me along to do it. So it was, it was a bit of an exercise in, um, in personal self-control and motivation and all of that. Um, uh, but it ended up, uh, really great I think I mean I didn't really promote it I just kind of I was writing music for myself essentially and just happened to put it out for other people to enjoy and so Mm -hmm. I still every once in a while get people who will discover it even though it's been out since 2016 summer of 2016 I think it's it's been a minute um and people will still discover it and be like yo why haven't I heard this before it's like well I (laughs) I really didn't talk about it much but uh but it is something that I'm that I'm very proud of that I um that I'm really glad I was able to complete. Awesome, and and, and also your uh, you and your guitarist James uh, from Ozai. Uh, you also have the uh, I guess it's your production studio or your recording studio yeah. thing. What it, it, talk talk a little bit about that <coughs> real quick. Um, so it's giant giant spoon productions. Correct. There we go. Yes. Um, I always pictured like I always <laughs> anytime I see that I just think of that stupid thing that was on the internet years ago. It's like my spoon is too big <laughs> yes and my spoon is too big and that's a that would be a totally legitimate reason for why it would be that even though it's not okay um, <laughs> <laughs> no um it was um i've always been a huge fan of the matrix movies oh okay all uh, three of them by the way not just the first one we've had discussions about this yes. before yes, and your have. affinity for the prequels the star wars prequels yeah just because i mean they came out when I was a kid and Same. I mean, Star Wars movies are basically written for kids. So, I mean, but, um, so the, the, the story behind that is like, we, it became sort of a running joke between me and my family, me and my friends to pull quotes from the matrix after I saw it because I was just so into it. And mm-hmm. obviously one of the big ones that everyone's quoted is there is no spoon. And, um, my family thought it would be really funny for Christmas one year to actually buy me this giant, <laughs> this obscenely large spoon. <laughs> oh, so that's the spoon that's in like the pictures of you. Yeah, that's, so that's exactly from right. Your, your parents. Yeah, and so then, and and that was just like an isolated incident. That was them being like, "Haha, here's this funny thing." Since you like the Matrix, um, <laughs> <laughs> it was it was an excellent gift, and I laughed a lot about it. But um, so then, when it came time that um, like I got done studying audio. And um, and my guitarist James and I we were uh, we were talking about wanting to start our own recording and production business. Um, that was just the, in all the names that came up. We were like, ah, Giant Spoon, that'd be funny. <laughs> so um, so yes, Giant Spoon Productions is our uh, production company. Our um, it's still pretty small. We don't really even have like a third party space for recording stuff yet. It's all 
in our houses, like on our um, our own. Not, I'd like to say it's not technically a bedroom setup since it's mostly in like our living rooms and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's a lot of our, our recordings. Room setup. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it incorporates a lot of uh, basically just techniques that allows us to not actually require like a soundproof space. So a lot of recording direct and, Mm -hmm. um, and all that stuff. And our whole, um, our whole goal and mentality with all of it is there's, um, uh, I don't, I don't know how it is in the, in the local scenes of other cities, but I know in Charlotte, it's been at at least for the time that, um, that James and I have been in a band together. We've noticed just a general, what feels like a lack of, and, in recording quality of local bands records, which I mean, it makes sense. If you're a local band, you're not going to have the budget to go to a major studio. Mm -hmm. Um, But as I was learning audio, I was like, well, as technology has improved and you know, we're not recording to tape where we can, we can record digitally and we have the the control Z undo. um, It's made everything so much easier. We're working with plugins now, not a bunch of like hardware. So for me, now it's a lot less about whether you have enough money to own all of the gear to be a, a successful studio owner. It's more about having the appropriate knowledge mm-hmm. of how to use your tools. There's a lot of engineers out there who would say you can get by just with the the tools that are built into your software. You don't even have to buy other stuff, which I kind of disagree with. But um, <laughs> but the idea was that like James and I sat down and we were like we were going to study really hard how to like the concepts behind putting together a really great record so that we can try to provide that for local bands. We, we essentially want to put out local bands records that are indistinguishable from a record that is from, um, from a band who's significantly more well known. Right. Um, and so far we've, uh, we've worked with a few clients, not a whole lot, you know, smaller, uh, people we, we generally know, but Mm -hmm. we have put out records with them and, um, we're happy with them and people seem to enjoy them. So, so do you currently have any folks that you're working with right now that, uh, or do you, is it something that, uh, is, there's a pretty, uh, st- steady stream of, you know, uh, clientele that comes in the door or I'm sure our clientele stream would be more steady if we worked on it a little harder. Okay. Um, but so let's see, last year we were mostly working with Blackwater Drowning on their second EP, mm. which is, Ruthless, I think mm-hmm. is what they called it. Um, and we were also working with Den of Wolves on their Love's Dead full-length album. Oh, okay. Um, both of those projects were really fun to work on. And then there was kind of like a break where um, we weren't really focusing on getting other clients because that was the point at which Ozai was about ready to start production on our record. We, we started laying out our studio sessions and getting drum parts ready. And, and we're still working on that now. Um, but so we weren't especially focused on trying to work on someone else's stuff. I really dug the uh, the production that you did on both of those um, both of those releases because they both had a completely different vibe about them. Yeah, um, the <coughs> Blackwater Drowning stuff definitely had more of that metalcore kind of vibe to it, mm-hmm. and then the Den of Wolves stuff, uh, whatever you guys did production wise on it, really brought to mind bands like. I don't know, like Corn or Slipknot or you know like that new metally type of sound, which I'm yeah. sure that's what those guys are going for. This fly in here is ruthless. He's gonna <laughs> yeah. die on camera. Peta's gonna be calling my ass up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, so um, was that was that a conscious decision? Was that something that you guys identified with them saying, "Hey, I think this is gonna work best for this sound," or is that something that you just were like, uh, or is that what they came to the table with saying, "Hey, we want the sound like." This band, this band, this band. Well, as we, as as James and I, kind of work to develop the the sound, because I know like different studios have sort of a signature sound that clients go to them to achieve that sound. While we work to get that, we've kind of just been asking our clients like, "What are you going for?" Mm-hmm. And so with Blackwater Drowning, there was like an obvious influence from uh, from kind of this Fear Factory, uh, Arch Enemy kind of thing, and. Um, and so uh, I, I, I did approach mixing them pretty differently. Um, Blackwater Drowning, I was going for something a bit tighter since a lot of their stuff was faster. There's a lot more. Uh, Chris Peavy, their drummer, he's, he's like really crazy with a lot of the really fast fills and just those like, uh, right. like drum rhythms. 
Um, and so I, I didn't feel with that mix that it was appropriate to get like just as, I don't know, like bone crushingly huge as we got with uh, Den of Wolves. That one was more about like a tight and fast aggression. Whereas Den of Wolves, I agree, is like I mean, the, the, the joke that, um, that James and I kind of used around the time that I was mixing that. We were kind of trying to figure out how to describe what their genre is. Like it's metal for sure. Uh, it's got the harsh vocals and the the heavy hitting drums, but it wasn't fast. It's all slower and groovier. So I think we took a um, a line from oh I don't even remember what the movie was, but it's the one with Brendan Fraser and um, and Steve Buscemi where they're in a band together or oh, something, and they like they um, take a label hostage or a recording studio hostage, something like that. Yeah, I'm gonna have to look up the the actual title of that. I, I I've seen the movie and it's escaping me right now, but <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh and, and I haven't seen it either, but James has, and so his reference to it was he he said that uh Den of Wolves genre and and I I love the Den of Wolves guys. They they won't be offended by this, but he said he he described it as power slob. <laughs> Power slob. The movie is Airheads. Yes. That. <laughs> Power slob. Yeah, and I don't that that obviously means nothing. That's not a real genre, but I felt that it described their music perfectly. It's just that really uh, heavy hitting kind of stuff. So. Well, yeah, and it, it definitely had that. I, I guess it's kind of that almost again that new metal-y sound mixed with that post grunge where it's just yes. you're not re- you don't really care yeah. about the intricacies of it it's more about trying to convey whatever the emotion is kind of thing yeah but, you know it's just but, it was just powerful it was it was so strong everything that those guys did in their performance um just hit hard and recording them was fun because um I don't know why it is, but like their rhythms are, are spot on so when it came to editing like their guitar and bass tracks editing was like crazy easy. Because it was just tight and spot on the beat. So let's get into Haken. So what cool. was your first? What was your first experience listening to Haken? Because um, for me, again, like I had said in the intro, I'm fairly new to Haken. I've only really listened to them for about a year, and uh, Kamori's guitarist, uh, John Conway, turned turned me on to them. And was like, hey, dude, you love progressive shit. Like, we always just send progressive shit back and forth yeah. to each other. He's like, <laughs> listen to this shit, and it was the Affinity album. Excellent, yeah. which is so good. And the first, I know John and I connected particularly strongly over Affinity. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Well, I think it was you who turned him onto it, and then he oh, turned me might onto be right. it. Yeah, so it kind of just went down the the domino line there. But um, I think you're right because I think I was recording uh, bass tracks for uh, for the Kamori album. Yes, um, and just while I was over that over there, John was was. Uh, we were just talking. I was. I think was it 2016 that I recorded those bass tracks, or was it last year? Man, it I was, don't even remember. It, it was it was like 2017. <laughs> I think it was 2017. I'd have yeah. to. I don't know. That was still their latest album. I really hope that it's not 2016. <laughs> I think it's 2017. Okay. I think right. I wrapped up everything in 2017. I'll have to look through my Instagram feed and I, I'll cry later about it. Yeah. Like, no. Exactly. No. Why is it taking so long? <laughs> um, but you know, right out the gate, when I heard the, um, is it 1984? 85. 85. Yeah. Sorry. See how. I'm not a real fan. The year that Dream Theater became a band. Oh, okay. Well, th- there we go. Now I'll remember it. <laughs> but when the first time I heard that, I was just like, oh, my God, this is fucking awesome. Yeah. Because it ca- it gave me, this is going to sound so weird, but I really felt like it was the progressive metal version of, like, Huey Lewis in the news. Like, I just kept thinking of, like, Back to the Future. I love that. I've never thought of that, but that's... Like, it in just fact, felt like the totally pow- it felt like the power of love in the beginning of Back to the Future, but like a yeah. really progressive metal version. I was just like, "This is fucking great!" And my wife, anytime I listen to it, she'd be like, "This is really weird. Why are you listening to this?" I'm like, yeah. "Because it's awesome. Stop judging me." Oh yeah, <laughs> the, the like the they're the like talking 80s. about D and D and shit like that too, and like and the the '80s drum samples in it. It's oh just yeah, like, I felt like I was watching MacGyver. Oh my god! When I listen to that song, so you know, good, that kind of thing. But that was my first introduction, and then and then when uh, shortly after they released Vector, and I went really deep into Vector. I love love that this album front to back. Awesome, yeah. And um, it's very different vibe at times from Affinity, but you know, and I've only recently started to go back into their earlier catalog. But um, so that was my introduction to him. So what 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 is what was your introduction to him? What what has it 
you know, what about their sound really has resonated with you and if any way, you know, influence your playing style or your production style, you know, let's talk about that. I think it's, uh, on, on a grand scale, I think it's safe to say that I've, I've been influenced fairly heavily by Haken, but, um, Let's see, my, my first uh, first exposure to them was um, actually through James, my guitarist in Ozai. Um, he, I mean, I, I even remember the day. He just, he came over to my house and I don't even know we were, what we were working on, whether we were recording stuff or writing stuff. And he was just like, hey man, check out this, uh, this record. Because he was all the time uh, showing stuff to me. And um, it, it, was, it was kind of hit or miss. My, my musical taste is, is much more narrow than James is like he he loves everything, and uh, and I unfortunately don't love everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, it's, you it's know a, what you a, like. <laughs> it's a running joke in the band. Um, but uh, but he showed me. It was the first track off of their uh, their album, The Mountain, mm-hmm. um, which is uh, the the first track is called The Path. It's mostly just uh, piano and vocal. It's just a really pretty thing. Uh, there's themes in it that uh, kind of conceptually echo throughout the rest of the album. And something about the melodies combined with the harmony of that song, it satisfied that kind of like beauty element that I like to hear in music. I've been a Dream Theater fan for a long time uh, because they combine a lot of elements that I like in music. Uh, energy, like the heavy side, mm-hmm. um, with this real... W- what I call beauty in terms of the way that certain melodies move and certain uh, chord progressions, which I've tried to dive into a little more to discover what is it about certain chord progressions that resonate with me so strongly. Mm -hmm. And I think I figured out that a lot of it just comes from a lot of the movie soundtracks that I've heard when I was a kid. Oh, okay. You know, so just like really epic sounding either from Disney or sci-fi soundtracks, you know. Um, But so Which ones in particular really uh, kind of help create that? Um, like any, oh, well, I any mean, composers in in particular, or uh, I mean, the the obvious one when I was much younger would be John Williams, um, fairly obviously, and not just Star Wars, but like actually, I, I want to say that that one of the ones that really resonates with me the most strongly is um, his work on the soundtrack for the Superman movies. With oh, Christopher yes. Reeve in it. Yes, that. I mean, it's it's like the Superman theme that everyone's heard throughout their entire life, but most people don't get ba- past the da 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 da. Right? There's so much more in that main theme that's like just some really cool melodies and and harmonies that, um, that kind of stuff would would influence me later. So now, hearing a lot of those really epic sounding melodies and harmonies, uh, just really resonate with me. Um, and so when I heard. Uh, Haken's The Path the first time, it was like, there's there's a lot of music that takes some time for me to get into. Like, I'll kind of not really get into it to begin with when I'm first showing it, but over time, I'll kind of remember bits of maybe the first time I heard it and kind of get into it a little more. That's, that's actually kind of how I am with uh, with Devin Townsend. Um, my The rest of my band has been into Devin Townsend for quite a while. Like, mm-hmm. they've loved all of his stuff. And um, and while I do absolutely acknowledge that he's an am- amazing composer and writer, for whatever reason, it was really hard for me to get into his stuff. We're, we're kind of talking like pre-deconstruction, okay. his deconstruction album. Because I'm the same way um, because I had, uh, John had tried to turn me on to Empath recently, mm-hmm. and I was just like, well, I can appreciate <laughs> the uh, musicality here and all of the uh, the technical prowess at work. But this is scatterbrained as hell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this is just like giving me a headache at this point. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I definitely feel you there on sometimes you have to let music sit. And, you know, I, I really like it when there's a band that challenges me in that way where I go, yeah, I don't really know if I like this. And I revisit it and I go, huh, this is making me appreciate music from a, a different perspective that I wouldn't have you know, otherwise gone down that path. And I find that to um, still be the case. I know when I was first diving into Dream Theater's discography, back when I was first coming into my own musically, um, obviously there were albums that I gravitated towards because they were a bit more accessible right off the bat, and other songs that I was like, no, nah, I'm not interested in in this. Like For whatever reason, when I first got into Dream Theater, their scenes from a memory album just bored me, but now it's one of my favorites, mm-hmm. because with time and further appreciation of it, it just 
Um, but that was not the case with uh, with Haken. uh, Haken's The Mountain album. Uh, like He showed that to me, and we listened to The Path, and I was like, oh, there's this... I don't know what it was, but I was like deriving a little bit of a Coldplay vibe from that first song. Maybe it's because it's like soft and floaty, and maybe it made me think I, of yeah, like the I, scientist or something. I don't know. I yeah, I could um, hear that. Uh, definitely better in my opinion than Coldplay. Oh but. no, <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm, I'm not like a big Coldplay fan or anything, but it, uh, it was just something about how that resonated, and then it immediately follows up with the song um, Atlas Stone, which is just a big old like wonderful prog tune that's got heavy bits and jazzy bits and epic bits and and all of that and um a lot of the times when when one of my bandmates or uh will show me a new song i'll listen to it and listen to it to be polite or whatever not that i necessarily hate it from the get-go <laughs> um, but the i will snobbery comes yeah. out right out right out the gate <laughs> no i mean i i mean i will listen all the way through it instead of being like yeah i'm bored and just turn it off uh-huh I will give it the full go. Um, and so that's that's what I planned to do with The Path when he first showed me that. And I didn't want to stop listening. So I, I continued on through to Atlas Stone. I was like, this is incredible. And then I think we actually had to stop listening after that because we had like a time constraint. But I immediately, um, I want to say I had Apple Music at that point. So I, I just went and downloaded it and started listening to it. Thought that was incredible. Um, their, I want to say at that point, like that's their third album. So the only other two albums they had out were Aquarius and Visions. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think Aquarius was up on Apple Music at that point. So all that they had out was The Mountain and Visions. So I downloaded Visions as well, started listening to that. I actually kind of preferred that one for a while. Um, I think it might be a bit more accessible from the get-go, but I was just like jamming those two albums constantly at the same time and um they were they were just awesome i was like i i can't get enough of this it's it's progressive it's it's doing what dream theater does for me but in a more modern way in right. a slightly different maybe quirkier way that mm -hmm. i enjoy a little bit more yeah i like the personality that is attached to their music um, absolutely like and maybe it's that british quirkiness or something that's being added to the mix i don't know Who knows? <laughs> but um i definitely hear that and it's funny you know uh, a band that was like that for me where i had multiple people trying to turn me on to it and i was just like i'm not interested in this and eventually i came around was um safety the safety fire oh. was a band like that for me because it was one of those bands that you know everybody was like you will love this listen to this and i was like I'm not, I don't like this. I really don't like this. And then literally months down the road, I was like, let me revisit that. I don't think I was looking at that the right way. And I go, okay, now I get it. I is actually that, really like this. Is that the one that Nolly Gaggood used to play guitar for? Uh, or is that Red Seas Fire? I, I can never remember. Safety Fire, uh, it had members of, um, oh my gosh. I'm going to have to look that up. There's going to be somebody in the comments just saying, it's yeah. these guys, you idiots. Um, Someone will tell us. I know eventually they ended up going and creating Good Tiger, which is a band that's out now. Oh, yeah. Um, that's right. I don't know if Nolly played with them. I don't know. I'll have to look that up. I'll have to add that in as an annotation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, I, again, I, I think it's really cool, like I said earlier, that there are bands that will challenge audiences to – push a little further, maybe push past their preconceived ideas yeah. of what they think is cool. <clears throat> and then it just, I don't know. I think it's really interesting when a band helps open up perspectives like that. So. Totally. Uh, right quick. I just yeah, wanted to absolutely. add um, when, uh, when, cause you were talking about how affinity was sort of your first mm -hmm. exposure to Haken. When that album came out, it hit me like a ton of bricks. It was, um, I don't know. I, I remember them like dropping singles for it. Their first single was, uh, initiate, which is like the first real song on the album, not an intro track. Um, 1985 was a single. Uh, their track, uh, The Endless Knot, mm -hmm. was a single. And that one, they, they dropped it with a lyric video that just aesthetically was very pleasing to watch. Um, and that album was like... I mean, it, so like you talk about how it had a little bit of 80s influence and um, my, my parents tell me all the time whenever I show the music that I'm listening to, they're like, your music sounds so much like the 80s. And, and that's not just uh, Haken's Affinity album, but lots of other stuff. I think it's just because I guess the chord progressions and stuff that I'm really into 
like harken back to some 80s stuff. And so this was like that embodied mm-hmm. um, in a single album. Every single song was um, not just listenable, but enjoyable to listen to. It had the heavy and progressive elements. It was uh, it was also their uh, their first full length album with um, their new bassist, Connor Green. Mm hmm. Um, who I, I really like his playing style. He's, he's got a lot of just cool stuff that he throws in there, but, um, the album as a whole, you know, uh, tracks like, uh, the architect. Mm-hmm. And like I mentioned, uh, the endless knot were just, uh, aside from being really energetic and cool songs. Um, by this point I had, I'd already like finished studying audio and everything, um, which the there there was an unfortunate side effect to to me studying that, which is now um, I have another criteria <laughs> to measure songs up to, and it really stinks because there are songs where I like like the harmonic and melodic content, but if the production stinks, mm-hmm. I can't get into it. Yeah, like a good example of that would be um, like um, Vola's "Applause of a Distant Crowd" album. Which I have not listened to that one before. Um, there's a particularly cool song on there called Alien Shivers um, that just has some really wonderful content in there. And when it hits the chorus where you've got the big eight strings and the percussive drums, the mix kind of falls flat a little mm-hmm. bit. It's not as big as you would expect it to be. And so unfortunately, some, that's something that detracts from the song. And I know it shouldn't, but I can't help it. You can't, you can't help what you like or, or right. what, you, what you want. So In my journey of uh, learning... Uh, audio and engineering Mm -hmm. i've already started to encounter that there's a few albums like there was the the baroness album that was just released which i love baroness to death but the new album of theirs i can't listen to because production wise it drives me freaking nuts yeah it just happens it gets so crunchy and distorted and you're like i want to hear the clarity of the instrumentation here what the fuck's happening (laughs) and i mean like i i actually do i i realize it comes across bad because i've like my band members have told me this but i i legitimately don't like that about what has happened to me since learning that like there were i remember when i first got into to prog and metal and stuff is there were uh like independent just guys on youtube who were doing these guitar jams that i just thought sounded so awesome like to the extent that i actually would use like the the youtube downloader sites and convert uh-huh. it into this like really shitty sounding mp3 that i would put on my two gigabyte ipod uh <laughs> to listen to and it was the worst quality sounding stuff but i would listen to it all the time because i thought it sounded cool like musically speaking um and then now i could never picture myself doing that because um, it's too important for me to be able to like feel the kick drum in my chest and and for the guitars to be nice and clear without being uh, like ear pokey and all that. But right. Haken's Affinity was perfect as far as I was concerned. Like it had, um, it just had wonderful production and the the music was right. It's it's easily one of my top five albums um, ever. It was definitely my album of the year for 2016. Um, and 2016 was an interesting year for prog records because we also got uh, Dream Theater's The Astonishing, mm-hmm. which was woof. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was woof. I, 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 uh, a lot of people liked it. Uh, a lot of people didn't. A lot of people like myself. Just it kind of fell flat. There were good tracks. And there were ones we didn't really care about. Um, Peripheries P3 came out that year. And that's another one of those albums that has grown on me. But at the time, I was like, I don't know that I like this as much as Juggernaut or P2. Um, Agreed. And yeah. then um, what else was there? I think uh, Animals as Leaders put out uh, The Madness of Many, which I also didn't like as much. Was as that in 2000? I want to say it was the back half of 2016. It may have been. I'll have to research it. Yeah. Look it up. I don't know. There was just, um, and then I, I'm trying to remember what what Devin Townsend put out in 2016. It was like a it was transcendent. What came out that year? Uh yeah, that that one. I think I think that's what it was. I'll have to that one did have some good tracks on it, though. I did really like that. Yeah, one. Uh, Animals did release uh, Madness of Many in 2016. Okay, yeah. So. The the joke that I was making around that time is like, Haken got the perfect record. In 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 my opinion, of course, but the uh, the 
the trade-off for that was that all my other favorite prog bands had to deliver a record that I didn't it like. It was as lackluster. Much. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's uh let's get into these lyrics here for The Good Doctor by yeah. Haken. Um so real quick. Did you like this album as much as Affinity? Was did it do different things for you? Were there things that you were like, eh, I don't really like the direction here with this one? What what were your thoughts on the album overall? I actually have a really hard time comparing it to Affinity because it's uh so different in a number of ways. Um what what Vector really does for me is um as we were just kind of talking about the uh the production value. Because this album, they got mixed. Uh, it was mixed by um, Adam Nolly Getgood, formerly of Periphery, mm-hmm. who, in my personal opinion, is delivering like the best metal mixes of like in the world. Very clean, today. modern sounding. Yeah, very, just very really clean. punchy without feeling over compressed. All of that stuff. Yeah, you don't get ear fatigue when you listen to it. Right. Exactly. Um, I just basically love everything that he's mixing, and so it was extremely exciting for me when it was like Haken, who is basically my favorite band right now, um, with the production of my favorite audio engineer. And because um, because I knew he was going to deliver them like his his specialty is really awesome drum tones. And he definitely delivered there. Like. As far as musical content, it's just different. <laughs> like, um, I feel like Haken will always have its its 80s influence because mm-hmm. I still get some of that. Um like with with the track that we're talking about today, like there are some parts with those like '80s drum Very samples. Very drums. Yeah, there's a little bit of like a Michael Jackson. It gets kind of new wavy at times, yeah. which is cool. Um, and that's all over the record. Um, but it's darker musically. It's not as happy sounding. It's a lot more melancholy. Mm-hmm. And um, so I've had a really hard time determining whether or not I like Vector more or less than Affinity. Um, I have found that I've been listening to it more than Affinity, but that could very well just be because it's more recent. So, um, okay, for tentatively, we'll say that they're on equal footing. Okay, me. well, they they offer different experiences, yes. and uh, both are experiences worth uh, jumping into, in my opinion, for sure. Um, so let's begin uh, with the lyrics. So the song starts off with the lyrics, calling Doctor Rex to cell block two, the nurses cry. 20 inmates scream in their beds, but one one is silent. An unusual case, this one deluded. Psychotic, then catatonic. The good doctor looks him up and down and smiles. It's time for a game. So with this section, for me... Saw vibes. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. Um, it's really interesting because... So obviously the album opens up with the instrumental piece and then it goes into this section here. Mm-hmm. And I think even if you skip the instrumental piece, this section re- right here for me just sets up the the mood and the tone of what the whole album's going to be. You know, it, it sets it up perfectly. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's very visual. It's almost like you're watching a film. Um, right. And... Really, there's not a whole lot there that I feel is like vague to the point where you're like I don't really know what it is they're talking about. Like it's very, it's very. It seems very clear to me that they're setting up the scene as this is an asylum, or some sort of psych ward where uh, this doctor is performing experiments on these inmates. Yeah, and there's what's not a whole lot of um, necessarily metaphorical content here. It's it's um, seems very literal. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, that being said, I did listen to an interview with the band where they were talking about the psychology behind this album and mm-hmm. how they wanted to get into some like um, older practices of psychology that were utilized to treat patients in the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they also wanted to approach this album from the standpoint of making it almost like those movies that tackle psychology, the way that psychology is tackled in films like yes. A Clockwork Orange or, yeah. or uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and stuff or like that. Even more recently, A Cure for Wellness. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Films like that. And you definitely get those vibes. You definitely get the vibe that you're in this place that is probably not as sanitary as it should right. be. Um, and you know the inmates are screaming in their beds. And you have this one that is this pe- peculiar... peculiar a case that is just 
enticing to this doctor here. Yeah. And um, d- so are there any things in this particular section that stand out to you that kind of make you go, you know, I really like the way that was utilized. I really like how that was delivered. Is there anything that really jumps out to you in this opening section? Uh, a lot of what jumped out to me when listening to the record was actually um, Ross Jennings' performance mm-hmm. of these lyrics, because this section, uh, the rest of the instruments kind of break down to this this sort of slap riff that they're yes. doing on the bass and on the eight string guitars, and um, and aside from that, the the rest of the instrumental content there is is quite minimalist. Like the keyboards are maybe holding a pad, but it's not very active there, and um, and his vocal is. I don't think it's doubled. It's like all just down to one single vocal and very up front and in your face. And that's kind of what reminded me of that 80s, like almost Michael Jackson kind of feel like right off the bat beginning of the album was like, huh? Okay. It was, it was just very upfront that way. As far as lyrically, um, I'm, I'm reminded a lot like uh, dream theater has, has tackled some of this stuff before, particularly on their, um, six degrees of inner turbulence album. Um, so it, it's kind of, uh, kind of par for the course. I think it's a, a, a a topic that a number of prog groups have kind of explored a little bit. And I think Haken here seems to be taking it in a slightly more like experimental and, and dark, uh, dark way. Right, um, but not sacrificing the the catchiness of the the vocals and the I mean everything. When I even just read these words, I can instantly hear that calling Doctor Rex to sell block two. Like it's yeah. just it, it's so catchy, and it just it it just hovers around in your head endlessly. And from there, like everything else just kind of comes naturally when you just read the words. Yeah. So I mean, kudos to them on creating some really catchy uh, vocal lines and you know, the lyrics are very descriptive, but then, you know, it doesn't sacrifice the weird progressive stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know if you've ever caught when listening to it, but when they hit the uh, it's time for a game line, mm-hmm. that's one of the few spots on the album where they actually did do some harsh vocals. It's just barely blended in. Underneath. Oh, I did not notice and that. And so it's, it makes it sound like darker and more sinister right on that line. Oh, that's, that's interesting. That's why I get the Saw vibes. That's I'm Okay. Like, Shall we play a game? You know, like that whole thing. Let's play a game. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so let's move on into the next section here. This yeah. could be, uh, this is the chorus essentially here. Yes. So uh, we begin the chorus with electricity is the prescription he needs. Bring him back to society. Electricity, the cure that he really needs. Bring an empire to its knees. Um, so it, it was really hard for me to not just start. <laughs> yeah oh my gosh it's so oh it just gives it's me goosebumps catchy. anytime that i even hear it and i just instantly have to start singing along to it um but so so obviously uh this doctor is using shock therapy with this one patient that is mm-hmm. you know perplexing to him it's like oh this is interesting i want to see if i can really try to tap into the uh the inner state of this particular case here um but one of the things that jumps out to me that's really, really interesting is the last line, which says, bring an empire to its knees. Yeah. And so I did some research on the album as a whole, and it's kind of a concept album. Like, everything kind of is strung together. Mm-hmm. At times, they kind of deviate from it. But for the most part, it's it's a concept album that talks about you know this internal uh, journey that this patient takes to, I guess, unlock some hidden mysteries within their psyche uh for lack of a better description um but this section here always brought to mind films like manchurian candidate for me you know the whole bring bring an empire to its knees Mm -hmm. um now i could also interpret it as you know the empire is just how strong his will and his uh his mental state is and this doctor wants to see if he can break him out yeah. of this i've also but noticed that in a lot of uh, haken's lyrical content they use um they use a lot of a lot of imagery that centers around royalty and kingdoms and empires and things like that uh, uh other examples would be uh the obvious one would be the cockroach king off of their uh mountain album mm-hmm. um but also i believe in um 
and the the album uh, excuse me the song veil off of this album yes um there's other references to um like oh, i'm trying to remember what the line is but like there's a reference to like uh, our our tainted kingdom or something like that that's uh that's kind of a common theme that they kind of bring through and i i think that may be just a bit of a like a lyrical device that um that Ross Jennings likes to use mm-hmm. um, to refer to a few different things. So um, is this something that, um, so you've talked about how when you've been writing lyrics, do you like to try to be as, like when you and Phil are writing lyrics, do mm-hmm. you guys like to be as upfront as they are with some of the descriptions that they're creating? Do you like to go more a vague route when it comes to creating the concept or whatever it is that you're, you're, you're touching upon. What, what, what about like this type of music? Like, does it have any resonance to what it is that you've written in the past? Um, cause I know for me, hmm. whenever I write lyrics, everything usually has like three different meanings to it. It always starts with yeah. the person. <laughs> it always starts with the personal. Uh, it goes into the concept of whatever it is I'm, I'm writing about. And then from there, I also try to just add some other things that, I just want people to be able to pull back layers if they yeah. want them. Yeah. I I think both Phil and I like to write in uh in some differing layers of complexity. Also depending on whether or not the subject of a song is a concept or a story. Uh the album that we're writing right now is actually it's a story album and so a number of the songs have to be kind of blatantly obvious about what's going on, like a bit more like the the first verse of this, almost narrative-like, right. talking about characters and actions as opposed to uh, feelings and abstract com- <laughs> abstract concepts. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, however, I, I do feel that there is almost always, like I, I really, personal taste-wise, I, I, I tend not to like it when a song is too straightforward when approaching... A concept I like for it to be written in a way that is that is poetic. That's not just a way that we would speak, the way that we would verbalize a a, a particular like just in regular speech describing a concept. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I like a, a certain poetic element, um, even if you're describing something literal. I think there's there's more there are creative ways to put it. Um, so I think how they're they're using this line like bring an empire to its knees i'm i'm inclined to agree with you on on that it's uh it's i feel like it's referring to sort of the this uh this this good doctor's um desire to seemingly sort of test the bounds of this this patient's uh sort of mental capacity mm. um and, and his his sanity yeah absolutely and i you know like i said you can definitely get vibes of like um Clockwork Orange, but I also get vibes of like um, I don't know, like Christopher Nolan's films, like Memento and mm-hmm. and, and Inception, uh, with some of this material. So I yeah. think it's cool that that metaphor. So many, yeah, so many, so many, you know, just s- short descriptive words can create such a, a vast uh, visual idea of you know what this landscape looks like. Yeah, um, and and then things get even cooler when you get into songs like puzzle box where because yes. i even get vibes of almost like hellraiser or something like that for me at least because i'm just thinking of maybe being literal with the little puzzle box that they have in those films. puzzle but, box is definitely a favorite track of mine um it's just huge so uh so let's move on into the next section here okay. uh inside his mind sparks fly vague memories of a caved in broken life inside his mind sparks fly vague memories of a caved in broken life so, really, throughout the rest of the song, uh, we really don't have much deviation from the prior sections that we just touched on, like the chorus, and then this section here gets repeated again. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do have another section that kind of pops up here, which I'll read uh, briefly. Uh, make sure his arms are bound and all his pills go down. Make all his secrets drown. Render his mind unsound. So, you know, again, I think... This is, again, just really setting the stage for we're about to take this journey into the the confines of this patient's mind. And this is really just the beginning of this 
crazy journey that we're about to go on. Yeah. Um, and you know, again, I this is very similar to the song that I did um, recently. Uh, where I talked about uh, Coed and Cambria's Gravity's Union, and there's a section in that song where there's a doctor barking orders, and uh-huh. I really like how this goes into that too, where it's it's almost like an actor is just you know acting out this scene. And, and you also get that that moment right in the middle of the the instrument where there's a break in the instruments, and you hear the doctor going, <laughs> "Yes, or whatever." Yes, um, and then it goes into the really progressive, almost genty type of uh, instrumentation. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's 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 really cool because it becomes almost like a fun house when you're listening to it. Yeah, it's um, and I, I think ultimately lyrically, this song is is fairly straightforward. I mean, like you said, there's there's not it, it's mostly like a lot of repetition of different sections in kind of different ways. So you you get the um, the inside his mind sparks fly bit. Uh, you see that come back as sort of like. A, I don't know. It's it's er, like right towards the end of the song, you see that come back in in a way that's almost reminiscent of a chorus, even though its its uh, its previous iteration was essentially second verse, mm-hmm. um, and then then you get the chorus again. So it's um, it's it's interesting with this song. They leave so much up to the imagination because lyrically, there's not a lot. You you essentially have like three or maybe four sections of different lyrical content, and um, and you. It's. I think it's really quite cool that you have to fill in the rest of the picture yourself. Yeah. Uh, with with how it's going, because I mean, like all in all, we really don't actually know that much about the doctor. Like it. We don't know about the doctor. We don't know about this patient, and it's really just like, oh, what is going on here? Yeah. And it c- kind of just intrigues you, and you go, huh. I wonder what this is all about. And I feel like we we know more about the patient than the doctor, despite the name of the song. Because like all we really know is like narratively speaking, the 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 doctor looks him up and down and smiles and says it's time for a game, basically. And then later, it's it's essentially implied that he's telling perhaps like the nurses or the aides to make sure that the patient's arms are bound, etc. Um, so it's and obviously the other inmates are afraid of him in some capacity right so there's there's so much that that we don't know about that character but given what it it's it's almost like what we know about the character of the doctor is implied through what they tell us about the patient it's it's kind of a weird roundabout way of talking about a character yeah absolutely it's really again really straightforward but then at the same time you can go into all these different layers of just like yeah. Oh, we're really only given this backstory through this this character's eyes, through this character's actions, and I think it's a perfect uh, opener for an album. And it, I know that when I first heard, I was like, I need to figure out what the hell's going on here. This is really yeah. cool. So yeah, um, like I said, it, it's an album that uh, I feel goes to really interesting, like you had pointed out, darker places than uh, Affinity. But you know, it's one of those albums that. If I'm in the mood to listen to something that's a little more dark and sinister, but still has that progressive, catchy vibe to it, yeah. I, this is the one that I go to. And if I want to get into the more, I don't want to say lighthearted, but the the funner album of the two, I usually go to Affinity. <laughs> if I, I don't want disagree. my if I want my Huey Lewis in the News Prague right. edition. <laughs> Um, yeah. But that's our interpretation of this song and what we think the song is about. If you have any thoughts, ideas, or comments you would like to make on this song, please leave them in the comment section below. Uh, Cole, where can people find you online or inquire into uh, if they want to get some production stuff done uh, with uh, you and, and James, if they want to book you for an event? How can people reach out to you? Um, currently, best way, since I'm still kind of in the process of on getting my website all together, um, best ways to get in touch with me. Um, I am on Facebook, like everyone else is. Um, I'm also on probably the the place where you can most see what's going on is uh, my Instagram. My uh, my Instagram handle is uh, was it? at Cole Millward Base. I think uh, most of what I put on there is uh, pictures from my gigs and uh, and I like to do a lot of like short cover videos of what i'm listening to you need to check out his cover of the Wii menu music oh my god that was the thing that i did a year ago yeah i i spent a week um putting together an arrangement of the uh it is fantastic the, the me creator from the from the old Wii, um <laughs> and it, it was a lot of fun um, i will definitely be linking that youtube video in the description below so please check cool. that out <laughs> Huh.
<laughs> yeah. Um, and aside from that, I can be contacted for uh, almost anything else, be it production or gigs or um, bass playing lessons, anything of that sort. Um, at my email address. Um, can I give that? Is that yeah, cool? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, email address is cole.millward at gmail.com. Um, super simple. So. All right, awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for watching the video. Uh, thank you again, Cole, for coming in. Absolutely. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Love.